In this narrow gully in forest understory, we see on each bank a beautiful population of Amborella. Of course, I did hope really to see the Amborella tricopoda because just as we know, it is considered as the most primitive angiosperm. Actually, it's uh, nothing is very simple. All the molecular analysis uh, since about 20 years show that it is totally divergent at the base of all the other groups of angiosperm. Even other primitive mm. groups like Nafea, like Cabomba, like Chloranthaceae, Schizandraceae, uh, all of these uh, groups, uh, Laurel, uh, Magnolial, etc., are sister group of Amborella and even Ostrobileia, which was before considered as the most primitive from Australia, is considered also as a sister group. But what is a little bit strange is that New Caledonia, according to what we know now, is immersed only since about uh, less than 40 million years and before it was totally submerged. So it is where was this Amborella because it is supposed that the origin is back to 140 to 200 something million years ago and nothing similar in Australia or in New Zealand, which were close. So probably there were some islands, some steppe islands uh, with immersed vegetation because this Amborella, of course, has some relatives in uh, more than 38 or 40 million years ago. Anyway, we see it looks like nothing special. We can say it's a shrub with green leaves, <laughs> simply. And, but the leaves have a beautiful shape, they are undulated. We see the vines, which are very well designed, especially on the lower surface of the leaves. The leaves so are undulated and even sometimes a little bit indentated. The growth habit is uh, characteristic in the sense that all the stems are totally plagiotropic, totally horizontal, and it is a disticus leaf arrangement. It's perfectly adapted, of course, to the shaded environment of the forest understory. Considering the growth habit, it's uh, quite simple. There are stems, so first are horizontally oriented, after they become in the older parts, more erect. It's very usual in many trees, this uh, architectural pattern. We see clearly here, for instance, that a new stem is arising from this place where it was bended. So this is not surprising. And also it's able to grow again from the base. So it's why we can see individuals with either some stems, this is an old stem, a younger and much more vigorous one arising from the base. So, of course, this basal branching is very frequent in primitive angiosperm and also other plants like, uh, like a fight, for instance. We see it uh, can be small even when, when it's cut, damaged, no problem. It can recover easily with new stems. And, uh, oh yes, I see, uh, oh yes, a tall one, uh, because usually it's considered to be two, three meters tall, but this one is probably five meters tall. And uh, the diameter of the stem is, uh, I think, about uh, something like 10 centimeters. Oh, oh yes, uh, oh. It's an old guy. Wow. Unfortunately, I don't see flowers of, of fruits. It's a dioecious, so it means that male and female individuals are separate. But uh, yes, it's uh, almost 10 centimeters in diameter. At the base, even maybe 12. So it's uh, probably one of the biggest individuals we can see. It is, oh yes, uh, five. Five meters tall, about. Uh, I should like to see some fruit, but maybe later we can see because it's uh, supposed to flower mostly in March or April. So now in August, in winter, it's uh, no normal not to see flowers, but maybe some maturing fruits. So 
So here we can clearly see that the diameter is, oh yes, 12 centimeters, something like that. It's probably a very old individual, still retaining its uh, some old branches and even old branches are still growing. So we see actually that the architecture is quite simple in this umbrella. It's not surprising for a primitive angiosperm. So when, when some botanists were thinking that the most primitive angiosperm uh, were uh, more or less monocolous with big trunks and big fruits, so <laughs> actually according to everything we know about the most primitive groups, it's never like this, uh, of course. This uh, corner theory is uh, very ex exciting, but uh, according uh, to what we can observe and what we know about the primitive plants, it's uh, not uh, at all uh, the case of the most primitive angiosperms. This is the tallest I have seen here. Maybe it can be a little bit taller, but probably not much taller on the big track on the canopy. Is, uh, actually, it's, uh, for me, it's uh, really recalling some totea in Aristolochiaceae. We know that Aristolochiaceae also are very primitive, but some totea from Malaysia or even from Western Ghats in India, like Ponmudiana, which is a big species. So it's very, very similar, except uh, of course, the details of the leaves and the flowers, but the growth habit for these primitive plants is very often with plagiotropic branches collecting the low level of light in forest understory. The small leaves, bigger and bigger, typical of a new shoot arising from an older shoot. The teeth on the leaf margin of the leaves are ending in a black spot. And this black spot actually is a hydatod. It is a kind of gland allowing excretion of water. And this is important because in humid environment like this forest and understory, there is no transpiration because the atmosphere is totally saturated in water. So the hydatos allow the excretion of water, so allow the penetration of the water through the roots, allowing absorption of the mineral salts useful for the plants. But also it allows the excretion of excess of some bad minerals, not useful, like uh, carbonate calcium, for instance, and also some bad molecules not useful for the plant. So these hydatos have to ways in adaptation, a kind of pump allowing penetration of water and also a kind of kidney eliminating the excess of bad minerals. It's interesting to see that we observe them in most primitive families like Chlorantaceae, many Aristolochiaceae, Aterospermataceae, Schizandraceae, etc. So maybe the first angiosperms appearing 150 or 200 million years ago had these hydatots on the periphery of the leaves. Most of the shrubs here are uh, sterile and have no inflorescences at all, uh, so it's impossible to know if it's male or female individuals, but here suddenly I see one with the red berries hanging down under the foliage, uh, grouped uh, by three, by two, by four in some cases. So this is clearly a female individual because this umbrella is a dioecious species. 
these uh, small uh, red uh, berry-like uh, fruits uh, are uh, characteristic uh, of uh, many understory shrubs in many families like uh, Rubiaceae, Melastomataceae, etc. in some other areas of the world and it's characteristic of fruits eaten by the small frugivorous birds of the forest understory. The size, about 5 millimeters, is really the size uh, perfect to be swollen by the small birds of the forest understory. In some cases it could be also eaten by some frugivorous uh, bats uh, because hanging down under the foliage. I'm happy finally to see the female sex of this umbrella. So we, on this uh, pleasure tropic shoot, we see all the foliage distributed just above the stem and under, of course, we see the berries just under the foliage. So the sexual reproduction is of course efficient and it uh, produces uh, small uh, red drupaceous fruits but you see also that vegetative propagation is possible. We see an old stem with the leaves, the big leaves, which has been broken and while reaching the soil we see it did produce many new adventitious roots and a young stem did emerge, all the young leaves emerging from the old broken stem. So it's why maybe in this gully this species is so well, so present and uh, with many individuals at all sizes. Here is the old stem broken and where it's broken we see all the adventitious roots. C'est une bouture. Oui, c'est une bouture. Stem cutting. It is a stem cutting, natural stem cutting. Vegetative propagation like this, also we can see it in uh, other very primitive families uh, like uh, Chlorantaceae in Ascarina, for instance, or Monimiaceae and the Aterospermataceae. So if it's surviving since more than 100 million years, it's maybe because it has all the best ways to survive. This one, which is already a little bit big, we see this old stem here, which is erect, and this it has also another stem arising a little bit above the soil. This one probably is quite old, but what is interesting is that this one arising from the base is still young because we see the structure of the bark, and we see it has leaves also all along the stem. So it is a very vigorous new stem and uh, I see an individual a little bit higher here. We see clearly an individual which is already 3.5 or 4 meters tall. This is the old stem with only very few branches and from the base we see that the last stem, much more vigorous, is thickened, is thickening, and now the trunk is about four, five centimeters in diameter, and all its crown is just displaying the leaves above this uh, small stream. And oh yes, this grows a bit to have many successive basal shoots, and finally one vigorous shoot. I did observe it in other quite similar primitive families. I mean Chlorantaceae. I did see this in Ascarina, for instance, in Borneo, and I did see also in Aterospermataceae, which is also a very primitive family, in Loreliopsis philippiana in Chile. So this grows a bit with successive basal shoots, and finally one which can have the cambium activity much more intense on creating a trunk is a very good way to go in forest understory because with low light it's good to have many branches spreading 
around the plant and finally when it is vigorous enough it can reach many meters in the case of the Chilean plant and the Ascarina it was about 30 meters tall so much higher than this Amborella the most primitive plant angiosperm of the world. Bye bye, Amborella.